you at all. Let me name Grace. Got such great information. And then we have now a really special treat. We have four students and one teacher from Portland Youth Builders, and they are here to kind of talk about, we're going to take them down memory lane. And we're going to have them talk to us about their experiences and we're going to learn more about the students' perspectives of what happens in classrooms, the um, positive things, and then things that are maybe not so positive. So what we want to do is give voice to that today, have them take a chance, and I have to I have to really give them a lot of credit we, um, for their courage to get up here and talk about their experience, to think deeply about this with us, not only to you folks, but to, this is being live streamed nationally, to, not to make you nervous, um, but, but, the, uh, <laughs> but a lot of people are watching this and recording it, and a lot of people have asked for a recording, so, um, that's what we're doing today. I have some questions, but we also want to hear questions from you. So if you have questions, I noticed that a lot of you waited very politely, as we do, for somebody to finish before you raise your hand. But as we move into opening the questions to the audience, just raise your hand so that we can get Laura and Jacob over. We need to talk, um, say the question through the microphone to the live stream our national audiences can hear what the questions are, okay? So my name is Vicki, and I'm gonna, I'll, we're gonna let the panel um, introduce themselves, and they're gonna tell a little bit about why, why learning in school is important to them, and, a little, and um, what kind of aspirations they have for school. And we're starting with Andre. Am I gonna start? Hello? Can you hear me? Uh, hi, I'm Andres. Yeah, uh, I'm Andres uh, Ambry, and I'm so nervous. I'm gonna lie to you guys. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> um, I do think education is very important because uh, you know it helps you further your life and your career and job and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's been very fun here at PYB. Uh, so far, I've been here for six months, and I've gotten my GED happily. Yeah. And, um, and um, I'm furthering my education and all that to um, get my bowling certificate and go into Idaho Western Union. So I'm like a month away from finishing. So. Hi, my name is Jasmine. Um, I'm also a PYB student. I guess y'all know that already. But for six months also. I've only passed two of my GED tests. I have two more to go. And what I want to pursue my career on is uh, medicine to be a pediatrician. Uh, my name is Jessica Brovac. I'm not a PYB student. Uh, I'm a teacher at PYB and I've been, in February it'll be eight years that I've been working at Portland Youth Builders. And I teach math there. Um, and in terms of my educational goals, I'm just like, what are your goals? Uh, I'm, I'm also a uh, doctoral student and I'm working on getting my EDD and I'm really interested in the perspectives of youth, particularly to come back to school, because um, I think it's very brave of them to come back to school after feeling pushed out of, of their previous schools, their experiences um, and what they have to say about the education system and what needs to to think 
back to the middle school or high school and how did teachers and students get along in the schools that you were um, previously attending? And can you share some examples or experiences that made you feel uncomfortable or at least just suspected? And I make sure that uh, Jacob back there is, if he can hear, everybody can hear. So if he goes like this, that means if you could speak a little bit louder, that would be terrific. Um, uh, high school experience with the middle school students. Honestly, teachers and students did not get along very well. Um, um, yeah, the teachers and students did not get along very well. They didn't actually quite like care about. I feel like they didn't really care about my opinion or my uh, my answers or anything like that because I am colored and all that. Kind of funny to say, um, <laughs> but. Um, I didn't, I didn't feel like I was really respected as a student that like they actually cared what I had to say. I like people think about myself. So, yeah. Um, I, I didn't really have that many uh, experiences where my high school was kind of bad. And just could you give us an example of something that happened that you really felt disrespected? What did the teacher say or do or the principal? I don't know, I just didn't get one-on-one -on -one support as much as I think I wanted to. Um, when things happened that, like fights broke out or this or that, uh, whether it involved me or not, and I was involved somehow or another, I didn't really feel like my um, my side of the story was really appreciated to like tell or didn't really, like, didn't really count for anything. That, um, it's like it didn't matter to other people's lives, right? So that's just kind of the, the experience. Um, for me, I'd say middle school was okay, but once I got to high school, it was kind of hard because it was, it wasn't as, I wasn't as close to my teachers as I was like wanting it to be. Um, I was more like, I don't know how to explain it probably. It's just that there's so many kids inside that classroom that they have to focus on. I don't think they're actually intending to be like separating you from the group. They just didn't have time to get to every single student. And that's what I like hate it at PYD. They have smaller classes and they get to you and they have like that one-on-one -on -one conversation with you and that support with you and they encourage you to do better. So yeah, I don't really think I had any like negative experiences at school that, at my other school with the teachers. So yeah. <laughs> okay, so for me, it would be like, a relationship with my teachers or anyone at my schools, like the previous schools, to like tell them, oh, this is going on, this is like, how do I stop it? Or I didn't feel comfortable ever even being there. I didn't feel like I, I could fit in or make new friends or even like talk to my teachers. So I tried multiple schools and my experience was all the same. Um, I'd miss school and it was like they didn't even notice or they didn't even care. It was like, and I didn't have that, it, like, um, I wasn't comfortable enough to be like, oh, I missed this day, what did I miss? Where am I? My assignment, and they were just kind of like, you missed, that's your problem, whatever, you know? Um, so yeah, that was kind of where I felt kind of disrespected, like I, I, like I didn't matter to them, or, or what I had to say, because they just there's too many students for them to care and like in those classes. So I like how PYD has smaller classes, and they can like take a day of parents to sit down and like 
talk to you when you have that relationship with a teacher who actually sit down and be like, this is going on. I don't understand this. Can you please explain it to me like step by step? Because we have that relationship. Um, I didn't personally feel any disrespect or uncomfortableness because because I like I approach teachers different to make them approach me different, but I can say that it's disrespectful the way that the school systems are set up to um, just ask for student support. I think it's very, very weak in most schools. Um, the school I went to now, the support is just so, I can say it's just, it's like outstanding. It's like they make our needs and wants their personal obligation. So just the support there is just so amazing, but I feel like other schools, they don't have that support system. So the system that they create is disrespectful towards the students. So I can just say that I didn't personally experience any disrespect or uncomfortableness. So I can say the support system, the, 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 the school system of support is disrespectful. So you said, and, and tell me if you're comfortable answering this, Sarah, that you acted differently with different teachers. And so can you talk a little bit more about that or give an example of how you chose to approach a teacher? What kinds of things did you think about? Um, like, if I feel like the teacher probably didn't like me or something like that, maybe like I'll ask more questions to make them mad or something like that, or I just won't come to their class or do something out to distract the class or stuff like that, little small things like that. Okay. So let's shift gears. As we, one of the things that we want to learn about and learn about, so what could, what are, if you looked at teachers and students who you think had positive relationships, what do teachers say and do? And if you have a teacher that you can think back to that you had a stronger relationship with that teacher, what was different about that teacher um, from the others that maybe you didn't have the same type of relationship? Um, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, for me, um, uh, teachers that had uh, personal relationships with students, I thought was um, really good for us. And um, I just, I, for personal experience, I, I, like, I don't know if you've watched it or not, but Zach, he's a, a language arts teacher. Uh, we'd always make jokes about Texas and Oregon, and we'd have controversies between each other. And um, it really made me understand that he's not just uh, like a beat, a big battle teacher. He's kind of a, uh, he can come down to our level as a, the authority type of thing, and he can come to the same level with us and talk to us as like people, just as people. And it's, it's really cool because um, he made me want to come to class and make me want to learn. and. Uh, read all of the passages and questions, and I'd always actually raise my hand when in other schools I wouldn't ever do that. Uh, I feel kind of dumb if I ever raise my hand in those classes. It makes me like makes me feel like I didn't understand it when everybody else did. But um, yeah, it just I like that. Um, I could honestly say that I actually enjoy coming to BYU every day because all the teachers are there helping you out and like encouraging you to do something better with yourself. And it's, just, it's not, it's you, it's the students there that's showing them that you're, you're wanting to do something better for yourself. And like other schools, I can honestly say, I hated coming to school, I hated math. I honestly did, I hated it because I didn't understand it. And like, I felt really like, I felt dumb being in, in math class because like my, I didn't understand the way that the, the teacher explained it. And then once I like got a PYD and I started going to math class there and I had Jessica actually, she's my math teacher. And like the way that she explains everything, she breaks it down for you and like helps you with like the questions. And then when you do it, you understand it because of the way she taught it to you. And the way she shows you, it's like, it's the little things that that count. Like honestly, I can honestly say that I actually enjoy math now 
I actually like it. And it makes me feel like I'm a lot smarter now. I think you were always that smart, <laughs> and I, I feel like sometimes like it just takes a, a person to hopefully recognize that, and you know, sometimes I don't think there's any real magic to what I do other than bel belief that this student can do it and not accept anything less than that. You're going to figure this out. Maybe it's me that has to change the way that I'm approaching how we work with Rod. I'll find another strategy, but it's definitely not you. It's probably maybe something I can do differently, but you can get it, and you have. In the past, I would think I had a positive relationship with my teachers, but now, like every single teacher, like I just said, like you will be hearing this a lot, but that PAG is successful. <laughs> Um, but yeah, like, hmm. I feel like teachers there at first and Portland, the Spanish PAG, um, will kind of, they all work around, like, they'll, like, it depends on what student they are working with to, like, so they change their, their, like, method of teaching, so they, See how you learn better, and then that's how they'll teach you. And I feel like that's how I've learned. And I, I understand math, social studies, and language arts now because of my teachers at PAG. And I want to thank all of my teachers for that. Um, I'd say positive teachers and relationships student relationships build off of past and progress a lot because it gives the teachers opportunity to gauge on each student's way of thinking and I guess their way of teaching the students or the teachers way of teaching. Um, I think it really does have a lot to do off of the class and progress because every teacher, I mean it say you have a class in the thirties, twenty to thirty that teacher has not been able to give every student the amount of support that each student might need. Like one student might need five percent, another student might need fifteen, another student might need one to two or three, but that teacher is not gonna be able to get around to twenty to thirty students as much as they could get around to five to ten or twelve, fifteen students. So I think it really goes a lot off of the classroom progress, which helps build support in teachers and students relationships it just gives the teachers more time to give each student individual lessons and learning and just to be able to engage and get to interact with the student which just being human beings that builds a relationship just doing nothing just talking and listening and seeing what a person is about and all that and how they think and process things that over time and yeah, that over time just builds a relationship on its own. So I think it really has a lot to do off of the classroom progress. <laughs> I think there's some people that agree with that. So I, I'm going to ask a question to you who have. Please, if you have questions, raise your hand. And we'll come around and get to you. And we'd love to hear the questions that you might have that is from your work or as your experiences from teachers or what you think. We really want to make sure that we get those those questions answered by the experts here, okay? I want to go back to what is something that all of you are saying, and what I'm hearing is you are, and tell me if I'm wrong, but in the school that you are currently in, you are thinking or get the impression that the teachers really want you to succeed, that they really believe you can learn, and that math is now, you know, they're saying that maybe there is a test tomorrow in math and that's why they are <laughs> making those comments, but it sounds like math is often challenging for students and they're saying, yes, I can make it. Can you kind of talk to us a little bit about why you think that's happening now and why it didn't happen before, that whole notion that I am, 
high expectations that I can succeed, I can be successful in school, and I can learn math and, and social studies and English. And just if you have, um, you don't have to go into all if you want to, but just if you have some thoughts, I think we would really like to hear what is it that the teacher said and did. Honestly, I think it goes off the base of, um, say, like, if the leader is not strong, then they're going to, they're going to have weak followers. So I think it all starts from, like, the head of the school, from Luis and Jill over there, those two amazing people. They're just, like, joyful down to earth people. Like, they really, 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 really care. So, as, like, them being the head of the school, they're going to attract staff members that, really, 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 really care. Like, they set the pace, they set the tempo, they lead the way. So these are the people they're gonna attract to the students to become better people and to show the way that they feel. I think we all second that. <laughs> and how can we tell? Actually, that, came, that question came up in a meeting of very insightful people and they said, how can we tell who to hire? What's going to tell us that? What are the what are we looking for in the people that we'll be able to reach across and can teach in diverse classrooms? And so, what is it? What would you recommend to that person? human beings, everybody in here obviously are these type of people, so it's like we just have to keep creating this and giving this to our youth so our youth can come up and be the next people that's coming to be in these places, so like the population of these type of people is just growing and growing and growing. It's not like something you can teach or create. We're not robots or humans, so we just have to give this knowledge off so this knowledge just goes in the world like a positive like our school is like why I really love our school and why I go I push to go to our school is because they're about creating creating opportunities for the youth to be able to become successful people and give back to the community. So it's really about the people that's giving back to the community and creating these opportunities which just all come together and become successful, better people and create opportunities like we're here trying to do now. of leadership for myself as a teacher uh, I need to be really reflective and I think I I think about that question about you know being vulnerable being open to be like what did I what did I do wrong what could I do differently next time uh, when I get feedback from from students about something I like how I handled it maybe I put them on blast I called them out you know I've learned a lot of things not to do or things to do better because I've been willing to have conversations with students and I think to be vulnerable with students you know, we ask them to be vulnerable every day, to come in, to be able to raise their hand and say, like, I'm not sure about this. Uh, that takes a lot of courage. And, you know, so I feel like I need to be vulnerable too. But it also, I feel supported by the other staff in my building um, that I can be, can be open and vulnerable, like, um, with them and in front of students to have a conversation about what I could do differently. Uh, so I think that's a really, really big piece of this. Um, is my, my feeling supported in the building as a teacher also then allows me to better support students as well. I couldn't have put it better. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Andre. Do you have any questions? There we go. I'll rub this one, Jacob. Uh, I appreciate 
the notion that a small class size helps, and I've been hearing that for years. Um, with 35 students in my average class, I don't have the opportunity of selecting the few that I get to teach, but I want to teach them all. I want to let them all know that I care, and when I have those one-on-one -on -one conversations, it really is a great experience. I hope that they're as well for me. What's something that a teacher can do in a big class to let you know that they really care about you? advice that uh, I think well may I learned from teachers at PAB early on when I was teaching was don't teach you know don't just teach the subject teach me so that I think that speaks to exactly what Val is saying as far as like yes the subject matter I know there's a lot of pressure um, the standard like testing to teach the, um, the common core state standards but I think that often feels like it's not about us as, as human beings right you're like not just putting information in students' heads, they're human, and I think recognizing those little those moments that we are all human together to be, I think oftentimes humor is a great place to start. Uh, but yeah, I'll never forget, and I, I find myself, I try to catch myself when I'm having, kind of when, when I think I get stressed out as a teacher, I'm like, oh, I'm trying to teach all this stuff, I want everyone to know it, but I just take a breath and I'm like, we're all, we're all humans together, and try to check in with each other on, on like a personal level, I think is, is better when I get overwhelmed by um, the subject. I'm like, I think I'm focusing too much on the subject, not who's in my room. Um, I, I just wonder, um, it sounds like before you were at PYB, you, you know, did not have positive educational experiences. And I'm just wondering, when you think back, was there a certain point in your education that you were really turned off? Was it elementary, middle, or high school? Have you always felt that way, or was there a point when it really started to feel like going to school was a chore and you really did not want to do it? For me, it was high school. Um, uh, obviously, um, it's just when there's a lot of people in the classroom and you don't get exactly the one-on-one -on -one support, it's kind of weird to go to a class where you Sometimes you don't even know your first name or your teacher. It's like, um, I don't know, I dropped out freshman year, so I kinda, it's kind of hard for me to say for, like prior, for next years and all, but um, it was just, it was just not all, it wasn't that good. It wasn't that fun to come to class because you, you didn't have that relationship to want to like, want to, it wasn't just for going to the class. It was like, I want to go see my teacher. I want to go say hi to Mr. So-and-so. So uh, I think a huge part of that was just like, wanting to, not just for the subject, but for the actual teacher, him or herself. So that's what it was like for me. Um, again, uh, I'll, say, I'll say the same thing you said, like basically, um, 
High school is where it started for me really where I didn't really like school or tried to stay away from school a little bit. And then I had to go back to doing all my classroom projects. Um, sports helped me a lot get through high school, but then just like in classrooms, it just felt like this is so big and over populated that the teachers didn't notice me or didn't like, I could, I felt like they didn't care, but I can't say they didn't care because they had hundreds of students, so I don't feel like they were just didn't care about me, but it just, they had to go back on a, in high school, just the population of the classrooms, just feel like I didn't have that support or that motivation from the teacher or that, that yeah, they didn't support, I was able to have to go in the population of the classrooms and the support that I was able to, I was able to receive from the teacher. I'm gonna um, paddle on you a little bit because I mean I had that luxury of being at the at the table where the students were thinking about the same questions that you had, and one of the things that they came up with was as a strategy was being able to laugh and having a sense of humor. So can you just give us some tips about how do you create in math class and science class and social studies a learning environment where people can laugh and have fun? Because you said that was really important. And we know when people are relaxed and they're having fun, they learn and they think better. So how do we create that? How do we create that? Okay. <laughs> Sounds like a really deep question. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, communication is key, in my opinion. I think that um, just sitting and talking one-on-one -on -one not just about like just schoolwork, but um, like making jokes with each other, laughing about certain things. It doesn't always have to be with your teachers, just about school. I mean, with me and Jessica, I'm not even going to that. But, <laughs> but it just, um, just having a good relationship with your teacher always creates some type of humor or good relationship with them. Um, it's just always, good talking to your teacher about not just school work because you get that actual, instead of just um, that's my teacher student relationship, you actually become like somewhat friends and like certain things you guys communicate and you guys get, same that's when you make jokes. <laughs> goes with teachers being open-minded and like supportive of students being themselves. So like, since the students are able to be themselves, they open to open up more to the teachers as well. So it goes with students and teachers being open-minded. And it just allows students to be themselves at the same time allow teachers to be themselves. So it, allow, it, it makes a way for us as human beings to be comfortable and not put up a floor for us to be ourselves. And to be human beings, we're not perfect, things are gonna be funny that we wanna laugh at, so I think it just comes with a lot of op being open-minded and just supporting the students to be themselves.
feel comfortable. Um, it's not always like um, work. It's a um, sometimes you can just take a break from your work and maybe talk about something random and then going back to your work and it's just like that gives me to kind of build that relationship and comfort and being able to assistant principal at a 1,600 student, or 1,160 student population, and I am trying to figure out how to connect with every one of those 1,160 kids. I, I'm curious, um, but it's hard. That's a lot of kids. So what are two pieces of advice, two things that I can do that you feel would help. I also believe that every interaction counts, so. But what are two, two pieces of advice that you could give me? I, I am also new to the high school level. I was an assistant principal at middle level, and it felt, it felt easier at middle level. And high school is different. So, help me out. <laughs> Um, I say like, I think you have a hard task and win, first of all. <laughs> but I say it's very important. I feel like, I don't, don't, don't at all. Uh, I feel like it's very capable for you to do that. Um, it will have to go with just one student at a time. Like say a long journey starts with one step at a time. Um, just try to get to know as many students as you can, create that grit that grit, that good relationship between them. So then like, say one student you won't be able to get to meet might be friends, real close friends with the student that you did get to meet. So that student like, hey man, I'm the principal, it's very nice, she's good, she's a very caring person, she's grateful, she's trying to help you very nice, she's sweet, whatever they want to say to their friend, because friends talk, so then that friend might want to go, oh, let me go talk to her, I might just go up to her, she might not have to come find me, so. I say just keep tackling one student at a time, and you might get some students coming to you to see who you is. <laughs> yeah, we have, we have a lot of students, <laughs> so maybe like if we can't do like one at a time, maybe we have groups, or like going into classes, and like, you know, getting to know them better, how they are, who they really are. Um, maybe like at lunch, you know, go out there, sit with them, talk. That's a lot of students. <laughs> uh, it's gonna be hard and challenging. Uh, you're capable of it though. I think. <laughs> um, um, just yeah, tackle them one like you said. Just might not get to them all, but I mean, you can't say you didn't try. So um, I would just go at it one at a time, go as many students, do as many students as you can, um, try to keep up with as many as you can. Um, I've never been an assistant principal, so <laughs> I'm not exactly sure how to do that. Um, I don't know, just keep going at it as hard as you can. I don't know. believe you can do it like there might be a lot of students but yeah like you said friends do talk friends do communicate with each other and like sometimes like me and my best friend we have a two-on-one conversation with the teacher we do everything together so maybe that would help <laughs> so yeah Thank you. you said you're a high school principal Oh, maybe you do three like since there's four grade levels, you do ceremony for each grade level, get to know each level individually, something like that probably. Yeah.
Um, I was about to ask, I feel like a lot of building relationships with students means that uh, they have to trust you, and I think one way to trust is to hear something that they need. Uh, so maybe having conversations where, like, you're, you know, tell your assistant principal what's what's going, like, panels or asking questions about what they can do differently. I, I students um, and staff get to be on case management teams at Portland East Hillbury, so that means that like Jasmine um, and Coral are on my are working on a case management team where there's staff like a teacher is there, um, construction trainer, tech trainer, uh, their advocate. So there's a there's a team of teachers and a team of staff that are working with them. But it's a place where students can give feedback about what's not working for them. And then I feel like as soon as we're able to support that and offer something for them and, and that um, it's going to help them, like that just really transforms um, our relationship and makes it like, OK, so I can actually ask for help if I do say something um, you're gonna make, try to make a difference for me. And I think that makes such a huge difference that support and like bringing a student into a conversation with a bunch of staff isn't like the scary thing that we're gonna tell you something is wrong. Um, it's really about like, what can we do for you? And then I think following through with that. If you're gonna ask students that, then make sure that you follow through with it. Um, but I think that'll be, that might win some folks over and then more folks and more folks and more folks. Good. Can I have something quick to say? Uh, I think just like you said it's a big 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 thing in our our generation now so it is it can be helpful it can be helpful but i think that teacher and the schools and the system still to try to be to pull away from that and to be able to interact hands-on to build that support and that key a relationship with students and, and staff so it, it is going to work in a sense because that's that's the generation of life we're living in but i still say that you guys should try to alternate away from that and try to find things, be more hands-on and experience some things like that to get the interaction going between students and staff. I agree with that. <laughs> um, but if your kids or students or they don't want to do the whole hands-on thing, um, we do, at our school, we do this thing called, um, I forgot what it's called. The, It's called Google Classroom. So, um, and, you know, if you don't show up to class or we um, uh, we forgot the paper at home or, or not at home, but at school or this or that, um, a majority of people have internet connection. So they can go online and, you know, see what assignment they missed or um, 
what's due and at what time, um, and it shows, and it just shows when people look at social media or some relatively close to that, it always works out too, because you're always on a phone, always on a computer, so I mean, you can't say you couldn't vote, so. We have um, time for one or two more audience questions. So while you're thinking about that, I have a, a pretty simple question. I, I, my last name is not Smith. It's a little bit hard and people stumble over that. And over the years, I, um, I could count on my right hand the number of people that can pronounce it after the third or fourth time that they talk to me. So do you, as you went through school, did you have trouble with people even understanding or learning your name? Um, and greeting you by name and pronouncing it correctly. Does that come up for you at all as, as well? And if so, can you give us an example? And then, then maybe tell us a little bit, what, how did that feel? <laughs> this isn't my real name. <laughs> <laughs> my real name is Demontre Washington. But um, just over the years, though, a lot of people can mispronounce my name. It was, it was, it was irritating a lot. It, was a, it grew on me. I don't have a common name, so. It kind of made me stay away from like wanting to always correct people because every time I thought my name was Montre, they said it was different. I heard all types of things, but as I've grown, you know, it didn't really matter to me. It just, it didn't matter to me really. So I didn't really care what I went by. Thought I was Demontre. That's I grew up with that name as well. But um, honestly, though, it did. It did take away from me a little bit wanting to even say my name. I went to the, like at school, not everybody calls me Dada. I just like, hey, my name is Dada, my name is Dada. Instead of like so many people getting my name wrong and making me want to correct them, it's just, I don't even want to do that no more. Like it took away from that. So people getting your name wrong can have a little effect to you and change the way you want to do things, but uh, it is what it is. <laughs> People used to call it Zachata, and it was actually Zacata. And I don't know, like, I didn't have, like, growing up, I'd say with that name, people used to, like, tease me because it sounds like the Spanish word for shoe, but that's Zapato. And uh, I didn't, like, feel like it wasn't, like, a comfortable word to say, like, for me to say my last name out loud wasn't really comfortable for me. And then once I grew out of it, I was like, yeah, my last name is Zapata. And then I'm just like, I kind of got over it because like I was used to like how many people mispronounced it and how many people actually made fun of it. So I was like, it's kind of like, I'm over it now. I'm growing up. I mean, huh. people are going to say whatever they're going to say. I can add that to a little bit. Like, like I'm the type of guy like somebody get my name wrong that doesn't like really personally affect me but in ways I have seen it like affect people that I know like oh I'm looking for like they don't even care enough to learn my name or they don't even care enough to even hear me say my name or whatever or whatnot so it can go both ways some people are not like personally strong to like not let that affect them some people take that personal to like they feel like they're not cared about or not wanted or things like that We have the, the really great honor to go and um, do a, what we call a reflection group with students at, um, at Portland Youth Builders. They were helping us just to kind of develop questions and a way of, do, um, of beginning that conversation that may be hard between students and between teachers. And, and one of the things that I, one of my favorite um, <laughs> memories was a student that said, he was 18, but back when I was 16 and I knew everything. Uh, and I just thought of all my teachers that they were wealthy, they grew up with a silver spoon in their mouth, that they just didn't have any idea or could not even understand what my life was about. 
And what he said is he learned that, that some of the stereotypes that he was angry about, he harbored some of those for teachers. So can you kind of talk a little bit about when you started to get to know teachers, did you change your perspective or change your thinking about who they really were once you started to build a relationship with them? Well, for you, Wade. <laughs> <clears throat> um, you know, a majority of my teachers at my high school, I didn't, I thought they were all rich because they lived in a richer neighborhood. I thought they were all rich. They were all stuck up and rude. And because I was, I grew up kind of poor. So I always felt like they thought they were better than me. And I went to that same 16 year old stage where I always <laughs> thought I knew everything, I still do. But, um, uh, yeah, it just completely changed. And then when I noticed that they actually weren't like that, there was just, their job was hard on them. Cause I mean, being a teacher is not easy. I mean, I would assume. So being, um, I assumed that they had it hard too. So I should give them a little bit less, I should give them more slack. So I give them a chance to actually, you know, get to know me and I get to know them so we can actually be a little bit more on talking terms. <laughs> and um, yeah, so it's, for me, it's completely changed my mind on what I thought teachers were and what they are now. Cause I think you guys are actually people. <laughs> so. um, I grew up thinking teachers lived at school. I never believed that they actually went home when I was younger. And then once I got to like fifth or fourth grade, I think, I asked my teacher, I was like, what do you do after school? Like, do you go home or do you guys stay here? And they told me that they go home and they take care of their kids. And that made me think a lot. Like, just because you're a teacher doesn't mean you're gonna live at school. So, it's true, but there's like, it's just, it made me think like, yeah, they have a life outside of school. They have, they have other things to, t to like think about. They're not just, they have their family or they have their dogs or cats or whatever they have over there. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, to take care of at home. And, I don't know, I just like became a more open person once I like got to like middle school and high school about my teachers. So I didn't really have anything negative against them after I learned that, but yeah. Shout out to Tammy. <laughs> um, it came to me and it hit me a little bit. There's a few experiences, but one major one, I'm a father of 20 kids, but um, I have a teacher right now currently at my school. And he's a father of two, as a very young father of two, uh, my son Jaden. And um, sometimes when he comes into school, he doesn't bring his problems to school, but like we're human, so like if he has a problem, you can see it on his face in the moment. But like me and him have a good relationship, so sometimes we sit down and talk. But just like him being a teacher and having kids, and sometimes his problems come with him to school just because we're human. Like, he don't bring his problems to school, but like, you got something wrong with your kid, anybody in here is gonna have a look on their face when they get to work, like. So it's like, when I sit down and talk to him and we have conversations, it just like shows me that like, teachers have problems too, teachers are human, teachers don't have perfect lives, they have family problems, they have all type of problems that everybody else has, even students, and like, just because the teachers don't make their world perfect, like they know everything or nothing like that, they don't have the problems for every answer, because if my teacher had the answer for every problem, he would have came to work to the school building, um, looking down on his face about his family problems. So just because the teachers, I mean, they have all the answers for everything in life, they're still human, but that, that's where having a son and interacting with a teacher that has kids around my son's age and being an open-minded person and talking to another open-minded person, it shows me that teachers are people too. I'm going record, if he's watching, that goes to Jack. <laughs> And 
I think sometimes um, speaking of people seeing people, when I felt like maybe stress coming from outside of the building and bringing it in, I often ask students uh, if something is up with them. You know, I approach them like, are you okay? What's going on? You know, I ask students to be vulnerable and to share maybe what's going on in their lives. So uh, when I know that I'm bringing, I try to be really cognizant, like I'm bringing in something, I'm some stress today. Um, and I'll try to share that with students. I'm not gonna share every detail about what's going on in my life, but I think like just letting them know that, hey, I had a really stressful, I had a lot of tr you know, trouble getting to sleep last night, I'm feeling really tired, just to kind of share that with them. Um, I find that you know, sometimes we might be afraid that, that students are gonna take advantage of that or something, but I think more, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but more often than not, it sort of builds that idea that I'm a, I'm a human being um, in this space as well. The last question before just about names and pronouncing names also made me think about, we haven't talked about this, but I think it's something important to say, and it speaks to that culturally responsive teaching, uh, is that being open to talk about racism and sexism with students in class. I mean, I think that's a huge piece of what students are bringing every day into the classroom, and I think it also speaks to that, what I said earlier about teaching the students who they are, not necessarily the subject that you're teaching. Um, so if a student had had an experience on the mass train, felt like they got asked to show proof of their ID, their ticket, um, we might talk about racial profiling and how that made that student feel, uh, because in many ways, I think what, for them to be able to share that experience at the beginning of the day in, in class, if they're not allowed to do that, then it's gonna be really hard for them to, to learn. Um, and I think it's helpful for us all to hear that from the students. Um, and I think those conversations that sometimes maybe can start as, as humorous can, can turn into more serious conversations that I know I've had with all the students up here about um, how racism and sexism have affected our lives. So I want to thank you for um, being here today. Your comments and you teaching us is probably more beneficial to us as teachers and administrators than a lot of teacher prep programs. So um, you have a lot of wise words and um, I know that we'll take and use this and take it back. And my big question for you is, I wrote down what, you know, a lot of the things that you said about you know, how you felt um, unheard, of, you know, unheard and disrespected and ignored. What made you decide to give it another chance? What flipped your switch to make you go, I'll make myself vulnerable to teachers again? And that's what I want to know. What turned you around for one more shot at it? My future. Um, me wanting to turn myself around, it was a really, really, it went into my bubble. I didn't, I like went outside the box to, you know, seek it help and do this and that. Um, I just, honestly, for me, I never thought I would get my GED. I thought I'd just work at a restaurant and, you know, live my way out because I know I have family members who own restaurants, you know. And um, my brother went previously to um, PYD and uh, he went three years ago, I believe. And um, he woke me up this night because he, he got his GED also there. And, uh, He's going to an electrician's union where they make a good amount of money, and money speaks to everyone. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, um, my future, and it, it really woke me up because say you make a good amount of money, uh, doing what you need to do in life and handling your business, and it it just woke me up. It just it was a, something to throw in my face saying that I could do it, that I could wake up every single day at six o'clock in the morning to drive or take the bus or. I don't live close. I live kind of far out from where our school is, so it's a mission for me to get there. But I do it every morning. They're currently have 100% attendance, and I'm doing an internship that's even farther away. <laughs> so it's it's hard work, but it shows that I to myself, not just to everybody else, but to myself that I can do it, that other people can do it, that it is possible if you really put your mind to it. Um. I actually didn't want to go, go back to school at all because I've tried four different programs and like two different schools. And I saw all these like, I was I was treated differently in every single one of them and I didn't think that I was gonna get the, like, the teaching that I wanted. So I decided to start working and I had 40 hour shifts 
during the week. And I would work from eight in the morning to seven, sometimes even later, sometimes till 10, 10 at night. And, and then my dad actually went up to me and told me that he found a program that his friend went to like years back. And I talked to my dad about it and I told him I don't want to go back to school. I was like tired of people, teachers judging me because I was Hispanic and I was a woman also and I wasn't going to get the support I wanted. And I was like, I'll just, I'll just, be, I'll just become a supervisor and be a manager at the store. And I thought about it and now I'm a supervisor at the store and I go to school and um, and I'm still thinking about my future. Like every day, I, I wake up and I and I realize that getting up in the morning, getting up at 7:45 or 8 o'clock, is actually changing me to get uh, closer to be to going to the college I want to go to and starting my career. And I can honestly say that I am really proud of myself for doing something that I've always wanted to do, and I feel really comfortable going off at school. You get a round of applause for that. <laughs> what made me go back to school was my mom. She kind of just like, well, it was like mostly my family. There was like a few like, I know they didn't do it to be rude, but it was kind of to motivate me because that's how my brother is. He kind of talks down on you so he can motivate you. And when he would tell me, like, oh, you're going to do nothing, you're just going to be nothing, whatever. And I was like, you know what, Mom, like, I'm just going to do this so I can prove him wrong. Like, <laughs> and now I am proving him wrong. I am doing better. I am doing this for myself, not just for him, <laughs> but for me, because I want to do something more than just be at home, like a housewife, like how people think that the women are for. Thank you.